Hello and welcome to <laughs> How to Europe. Um, today we're going to talk about how to promote games on the old continent, some tips how to promote your games in Europe. Um, first of all, thanks for coming. And second of all, also, thanks a lot to Film Victoria for enabling the International Speakers Program, which made it possible that I'm here today. Um, as every good talk, I want to start with some scary stats, because before we talk about how we promote games in Europe, I think it's important to talk about why we even want to promote games in Europe. And there's one stat that keeps coming up, and I think it's a really good one, and I can't show it often enough. I think it's the stat of the year. It's the number of Steam games released, and I think it shows a lot what is the challenge of today's gaming market. And as you can see, the number of Steam games released goes up pretty steep from 2014 on and goes pretty crazy in 2016 where we had 11 games per day. And 2017 isn't over yet, but predictions look a bit like that. And they might go like that. Because Steam Greenlight is gone, and now we have Steam Direct, and there's even more games now coming out. So there's just more competition. And uh, I gave a similar PR talk at the GDC two years ago, and had some keep, uh, people coming up to me after the talk and saying, well, there's more games now, but I can just do one thing. I just make really good games, and that's it. And that's how I would just get through and we get my game really big. And then I found this really interesting piece on Gamma Sutra. Uh, and it basically they looked into games that have really good Steam reviews, but hardly any players. It's like hidden gems. And in the verdict, they asked how many Steam games have great reviews but little exposure. And their not so scientific verdict was a lot. They just found plenty of those. So in short, um, even making a really good game isn't often enough today to come through. Marketing your game is more important, even if it is an extra burn or an extra task on a game developer. And one obvious thing to do is to look into other markets, not only in your market, which other players you can reach, but just reach out into other markets. So if you look at the global market, um, uh, the global game market is 99, makes $99 billion per year. Um, and 23% of those come from the US. And I think in, as an Australian game developer, the US is a quite obvious market to target. First of all, because of the similar language, uh, similar culture in many ways. And it's a big market with one language that's easy to target. But then when we look at Europe, it's also a very big market. It's about 20%. Um, but of course, Europe brings some unique challenges with it that makes it maybe less obvious as the first choice, but it's more often the second choice for local game developers here, I would assume. And what are the challenges of Europe? Uh, a friend of mine, she's American, she's quite cool, and she summed it up in a really nice way. She basically said for her, Europe is a bit like, it's like Disneyland. You basically, you get on a train or you get in a car and within a half an hour, an hour, you're in the next country and it looks a bit different and people speak another language. And it's a bit, it's funny, but it's also obviously brings challenges with it because there's so many different cultures on so little space. And that's why she loves Europe. And the other reason she was also making games was that she said she loves Europe because there's a lot of money to be made because it's a quite wealthy market with a high spending power. So the topics I want to cover today is the different gaming markets in Europe, then look at the different media landscapes and what is unique about them and how you can tackle them differently how you can contact media and influencers best, 10 tips for promoting your game in Europe in no particular order, but just things I picked up over the years and I think are really useful. And then a summary of that. Before we start, some words about me. Uh, my name is Thomas Reisenecker. I'm the founder of Future Friends Games. Uh, it's a PR company and marketing company for mostly for indie games based in Brighton, UK. As you can probably hear by my Slight accent, I'm not English, but I'm actually Austrian, so I'm a German speaker, which also gives me uh, different insights into the German and Austrian market. Uh, I worked on loads of different games over the years, from really big titles like League of Legends or Smite or Paladins, to really more indie games like Old Mage Journey or Blackwood Crossing, Northgard, and so on. So it's more than 30 games in total over the years, and a lot of those time I worked at a company called Ico Partners, which is a pan-European PR agency. So in the talk, you will see lots of experiences are made there, but also they have a very good consulting part of the company. So I'm also going to quote uh, plenty of their data because it really gives a good, market, uh, good insight into the European market. I also worked a couple of years as a video game journalist, so I also know the other side of the game. And I also like to talk about PR when I'm not doing it at different events like here or GDC or Digital Pay. 
for today's talk, a short definition of Europe, um, just because it's not, Europe isn't uh, always Europe. What I mean by that is we're talking about Europe, the continent, geographically speaking, but we're not talking about Turkey and not uh, including Russia because they're really different gaming markets. We are also definitely not using the Eurovision definition of Europe because that would include Australia as well, so I'm not going to do that. And we don't talk about the European Union. Uh, as you may know, there's like smaller countries like Switzerland that are not in the European Union or the UK is about to leave the European Union, which is another challenge we're not going to tackle today. But we're going to talk about Europe as a continent, excluding those two territories mentioned. Disclaimer, of course, this is a talk about uh, lots of data, but also just lots of generalizations and recommendations for those countries. They are helpful, I think. But of course, if I say German media is not keen on interviews, that doesn't mean that no German journalist likes interviews. Those are just guidelines that should give you pointers in the right directions. So what are the biggest gaming market in Europe? If we look at it on a global scale, you see here the top 20 countries worldwide for revenue, and China and the US, Japan, South Korea, the biggest, um, Australia, um, the place number 13. Uh, what we're gonna focus on today is the place five which is Germany, number six is UK, number seven is France, number eight is Spain, and number 10 is Italy. So what you see here that in the top 10, you have five European countries. And those are going to be the main focus. We see it here again, they are generally referred as the big five Western European countries. And they go with the short form of EFIX, which stands for English, French, Italian, German and Spanish. Often also used as a short form for localizations. And as you can see, we said Europe in total makes 20% of the gaming market by revenue. Those five top countries, they make 17%, which means they are really impactful in the European landscape. If you compare that to Eastern Europe, this does even include that one graph, uh, Russia. We have roughly the same amount of players, but if it comes to total revenue, it only makes 3%, which means those markets have way less spending power, uh, which is also why we're gonna focus less on them today. Of course, they're still really important. They still work great for many games, but our focus for today is gonna be the EFIX countries. Um, next up is understanding the different media landscapes. And we're gonna talk about YouTubers and influencers as well, but they are often more a thing you have to tackle on a base-by-base -base basis, per game, per different title, for what you wanna to reach to them. Whereas media landscapes, which covers mostly websites, those are things that are more stable, so they are easier to represent in data and recommendations in that sense. Um, as you can see, there's already, if you just look at, there's a, a stat that covers which countries talk about which consoles or which platforms the most. And you can already see there's big differences. I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but for example, if you look at Spain, they love all console games, they are okay on Steam. If you look at Italy, they love PlayStation, they're not big fan of Steam games, covering not that much. So those are already little things that can point you in the direction of what could be a good target market for you. Or another interesting stat, where we look at the number of websites per country. The blue uh, graphs represent small websites, the red graphs mid-sized websites, and the green graphs large websites. And if you look at it, it's quite balanced, but there's one anatomy, which is that in the English graph, we see they have loads of big websites. And I think you might have heard the names of them. And that's, by the way, the first country we're gonna cover is the United Kingdom. And those English websites, for example, IGM, PC Gamer, Kotaku, PC Games and GameSpot, they are massive, uh, they have really good reach. What they also are, they are not all UK websites. Some of them are UK, some of them are US, most of them are mixed websites. For example, Kotaku uh, has a big US website, also has a UK team. Eurogamer is based in the UK, but has a massive uh, US readership. So there's a massive overlap between those websites because they share the same uh, language. Which of course gives them a really big readership. So there's one effect you can see if you do European PR. If three or four of those main websites cover your game at the same time, or the news at the same time, you suddenly see that they start swamping over into the other markets. This is really helpful if you only have the budget or possibilities to cover one market, because that means if you focus on the English media and you can break through, you actually gain some coverage from in the other markets as well. Of course, it's always more helpful to cover all those markets directly, but it is an option to do it like that. So I think the, big, the biggest learning for the UK media is definitely the English media is European-wide opinion leader. 
The reason for that is I worked as a news editor in, for German and Austrian websites as well. Most editors in the European countries speak English and those English websites are usually the biggest, they have the most budget, they have the most stuff. So they're going to bring out the news the fastest, they're going to have most budget for reviews, they're going to write the most features. So if you want to get news somewhere, reading English websites is a really big deal. Whereas the other way around, usually English editors don't read German websites. So often we would have that news leak in Germany and then two weeks later, two weeks later in England and German people were like, yeah, well, we know that already. But it just didn't leak out, it doesn't leak in the other way. So that strong crossover with the US, we just mentioned is another really significant point about the UK media landscape. And there's a downside of it. They have the really good reach, but obviously it means they also have a really, really strong competition. Because you're not the only, you know, uh, only one that knows uh, Eurogamer and PC Gamer and PC Games N, those editors get loads of email and they're gonna have way more pitches than you, uh, journalists in other countries. They also have a, which is uh, abnorm abnormally to other countries, they have a really big scene of freelancers. Uh, they are quite easy to find on Twitter, which is a really good tip if you want to get your indie game covered and you just read Rock, uh, Waypoint, Rock, Paper, Shotgun and all those websites and you see a name you don't know, you just check them out on Twitter, usually you find the website and you can build a really good database of freelancers, which gives you a good chance of getting coverage. And they are really open for interviews, for think pieces, for opinion pieces, for in-depth coverage, which is great and that is mostly happening in the English space. If you have a feature like that and you try to pitch it like Germany, they're just like, we don't have really stuff for that, we just want to write news and that's it. Those in-game features are luxury, I would almost say, of the English media because they have a bigger readership, they can afford to go into in-depth coverage. And also, uh, uh, YouTubers and streamers are often a bit ahead of the curve, so if you keep an eye on the English scene, you usually know what happens in the other markets straight after. If we go to France, uh, we have here the top five French websites uh, per reader. Uh, we have the most readers. And we see showvideo.com is massive compared to the other top websites, Millennium, Game Culture, Online, or Gameblog. And that is, the, I think, the major learning you should keep in mind for France. Show video is absolutely massive. Uh, they are actually, they are bigger than Eurogamer. I think they are bigger than PC Gamer. They are bigger than loads of English websites. And they only cover France. They are only speaking French. And the reason, apart from they are really good at coverage, they have loads of stuff, but they also have a massive forum, which brings them a lot of traffic. So if you can actually get your news uh, or your game on your video, that really helps to move copies in France. It is a hyper-competitive landscape when it comes to media. I've never seen that in any other uh, country, that if something goes really bad or happens to one website, that the other websites would write about it, not always in the nicest way. Um, that also comes with the caveat that if you give exclusives to one of the big websites, the other one will ask you why you didn't give it to them. So they're very competitive in that sense, which doesn't happen in the other markets as much. Culturally seen compared to other European countries, they're quite big on anime and esports, quite ahead on those things. Language matters a lot if you send assets, trailers, press releases. A lot of European countries, if it's not too wordy, you can come through with some English. In France, they really prefer if you localize your things. They're not a big fans of, of getting on with English content. And a nice extra from France is that you also have Belgium, parts of uh, Switzerland and French Canada as language markets that you can add up if you have your uh, assets localized. And if you come to Germany, um, again the top five websites in Germany and especially the first two are quite telling. The first one is GameStar, really big website, really big print magazine, only covers PC games. Second one is called PC Games does cover a little bit of console games, but is focused on PC games. And that's pretty much the main learning of Germany, I think, is that they are really, really very strong focus on PC games. They really like strategy games and simulation games. So all those games that have loads of little stats, where you can adjust loads of things, build things, those are typical German games. Simulation games that are big in Germany, you might know it as Farming Simulator, is every year one of the top selling games by far. And they even have a farm con where they invite people to a farm and show the new game and show some tractors. So it's really big in Germany. Uh, the media is quite straightforward in the sense that they are more traditional. They prefer the classic cycle of having news, previews and then reviews. They're really not big on feature content. You just have to give them what they want to work with and this is not feature content. Um, interestingly, games in Germany are in media sometimes, especially 
general interest media sometimes classified as software, not art. So if you look at France or a UK where The Guardian or Le Monde, they would have a culture section that covers music, that covers films, but also games. Um, that's quite common there. In Germany, not so much. Usually if they cover games, it's just a feature article on the side or it is a piece about software, a technology piece, but they are often treated as culture as much as in other countries, which brings some things which we're going to go into later. Germany is massive on podcasts. There's like a couple of really big podcasts. The biggest one get up to 20,000 euros on Patreon. It uh, doesn't happen in any other country in Europe or I think the world. It's just, it's a German thing. Um, also, if you want to make a media tour, Germany is quite annoying in that sense because if you make a media tour and visit different journalists or influencers, in England you would go to London and meet most people there. In Paris you would go to France. In Germany they're quite spread up. There's like three big centers. It's Munich, Berlin and Hamburg. So if you want to visit all those, you have to play in two or three days just to get around in Germany and visit all those people. There's also one thing called Rocket Beans TV, which is a, a Twitch and YouTube channel. They, it's like a TV channel that's on 24-7 a day. Uh, but they are really, really big. They are where, for most time, when they were on Twitch, the, in the top Twitch channels in the world, in the top 10, and they are still massive. So, apart from the media landscape, if you somehow make it on Rocket Beans TV, it's a really big uh, deal in Germany. Um, Twitter is not as big for, uh, for non-players in Germany. Uh, as I know Twitter from German-speaking friends, uh, usually it's used by journalists and it's used by really hardcore gamers. More casual gamers won't use Twitter and that has a quite obvious reason that if you've ever seen something in German, it's quite long. It's really hard to tweet in German with 140 characters. It might change now with the 280, but at the moment it's difficult. And also as a bonus, you have uh, Austria and Switzerland as extra market that also speak German. Next up, we come to Spain. Um, Spain, in that sense, is quite straightforward. They have three really big websites. It's 3D Juegos, Mary Station, and Vandal. And it's quite balanced in that sense that those are the three, top three. They like console games, not so much PC games. And obviously, Spanish is a widely spoken language, so there's plenty of extra markets coming with it if you have Spanish assets and Spanish localizations. And then Italy, the last one of the big five. Uh, again, Italy is more straightforward. It has multiplayer as the biggest website, Spazio Games the second biggest, and then REI Games Village and Eurogamer. But Italy has one thing that's quite interesting about it. There's a statistic that shows how many articles do writers has write, uh, write on average um, per day. And the France is, has like 1.5. And you, at average Italian gaming websites has almost three times the output. So they just write extre extreme amount of articles. We couldn't figure out why until this point. It's just how the media landscape works. They just write loads more, which brings obviously a lot of interesting things with it. One of it, they're very news focused. They have to write so many articles, they want to have loads of news. So if, even if you have smaller updates, they might be interesting to uh, Italian media where they won't get any traction in the English or German media, for example. And it also makes them very approachable because they're always looking out for news stories. Uh, one legal thing, doing giveaways in Italy is quite complicated. You have to have like an official form where you put it in and then you can set up a giveaway. Sometimes websites don't do that and they just do it, but technically they have a legal thing they should do. So it's always more complicated to set up bigger giveaways in Italy. Scandinavia and Netherlands, uh, just put them together here for one fact is we got asked a lot in the agency, we want to we wanna target, we wanna target Norway, we want to target Sweden, we want to target the Netherlands, they are high income countries. How can we get onto those websites? And the answer is they just don't have a lot of websites because their English is really good, so they just read English websites. Of course there are some, but in general they're usually uh, quite low on the list of, of countries you should localize the content for or should target specifically because that effect that English media's opinion leader is really, really strong in those markets. Eastern Europe, uh, I wish I would have more time here. They would definitely deserve to have a couple of extra slides. For time reasons, I had to just put them together here so that covers lots of countries from Romania, Poland, Slovakia, Slovenia, and so on. Uh, as a rule of thumb, they are really, really big on free-to-play games. So if you want to boost your player base, um, just have more pe people in a multiplayer game, it's really good to uh, tackle European media, uh, Eastern European media. They're not big on indie games. Also, like Germany, not very big on feature content. 
and they possibly have quite straightforward tone, which you shouldn't take as rude, but if you send a review code to an English edit editor, he might say something like, I'm terribly sorry for coming back late. Unfortunately, we don't have much time at the moment, but we maybe look into it in the future. Have a nice day. And a Polish editor might just say, like, not interested, thanks. So it's not meant to be rude. They just have often a more straightforward tone. Uh, in the third chapter, we're going to look at how to contact the media and different influencers in those countries. And the first, the first part here is meant for if you as a developer just want to target Europe as your own uh, from just yourself. You just go out and say, like, I want to target European media. And I think often that makes a lot of sense. Often it doesn't mean that you have to have an agency in Europe. Um, because all those editors speak English anyway, it often is just a matter of putting them on your mailing list, getting some contacts with them, and reaching out to them. But of course, before you can do that, you actually have to find them. So how you Google correctly in Europe is you use the local Google, so you go to Google.de for Germany, and Google FR for France, Google IT for Italy, and so on, and then you use those little extra search bar, which you can limit the search to a certain language, and a certain time frame, and also a certain country. Uh, sometimes that language field doesn't show up unless you log in with the correct language. So sometimes I would have to look for Italian editors and it doesn't show me the option to only search for Italian. So I have to go into Google, change my language to Italian and then look for it. No worries, it's all with Google Translate translated. You can still read everything, but it is really helpful to change the language there. Um, if you found your editors that you want to get in touch with, you also want to find the contact details somehow. And my to-go-to tool to find contact details is hunter.io. It's a really good website. Uh, you can just put in a website URL and it, and it just shows you all the email addresses it can find associated with it. And usually it does a really good job of giving you loads of email addresses of people that work at those websites. Another good one is to look people up on Twitter and see if they have their direct messages open or if they link on a website where they have an email address. Also, YouTube is really helpful to get in contact with a lot of people because in the About section, there's always a little field that tells you the email address. And in German, there's something called Impressum, which basically means, by German law, if you have a website, you have to have a little uh, field on your page where you have your official address, the, peop the person that's responsible for those websites, and also the email address. That's by law, so if you spot somewhere on a German website something called Impressum, just click on that and you're going to find the contact details there. Get the tone right in the emails is obviously not easy, especially if you're not um, familiar with the language or the culture. As a rule of thumb, if you're used to American uh, press releases or American communications, American advertisement, you just take that and tone it down a bit. So you just remove half of the awesomes and half of the cools, half of the explosions, um, when we worked with American agency, they would usually look at our draft of communications or pitches and say, like, this is a bit boring, like, what happened? And that's not boring, it's just European editors prefer to have it more dry, more straightforward, you won't have more factual. Obviously, it should still sound interesting, but don't turn it up to 11, maybe just leave it at 10. Apart from that, I think it's really important to just get the emails not only right in tone, but also in terms of the format. And what I'm going to show you now is an email format I use uh, for all my pictures. And that is just meant to keep it really short and to the point. And I think it's really helpful. Your response rate is really different if you get a good e pitch email done. It is, however, a lot of work to get a good one. So that's from a game I worked on called uh, A Normal Lost Phone. And the rule, I'm going to explain you the template. It's called the AIDA template. And that's actually the full email you're going to see there at the moment. And first, we want to start with the A, we want to get the attention of an editor, which means we need a really good subject line. So because they get like a couple of hundred emails a day, we want to have first step that they even open that email. In, in what that meant for a normal lost phone, because if you look at the name, it's, it's not a great name because it's called a normal lost phone, but it's a game for PC and mobile, and it sounds like a phone game, and you don't really know what it is, or is it a sentence? So it's a difficult one for a catchy subject line, which is why we moved the theme of the game way in front. We called it a mystery game dealing with homophobia and self-discovery. And then as, uh, after that, come to the game title, so people would actually open the email. After we got the attention, we want to get the interest of the reader. So usually we have the game pitch or the game text in a really short one or two sentences, really straightforward. What is it about? Why I'm emailing you today? Not wasting the time of the editor, just come to the point. And then immediately have a nice animated GIF 
show what the game is about and say, hey, if you want to see more, here's a link to our YouTube trailer. So hopefully by that point, the person is interested, watch the trailer, so now they have the desire to find out more. And that's the point where we either say, hey, you can find more information in our press room, hey, you can find more information in our press release attached, or on this website, or there's more videos here. So something where they can look up more. And if they still like what they see, you want to give them a call to action. And that could be, here's your review code, um, at this event you want to meet, um, do you want to have an interview, um, whatever you want to get across in this email. So that's a really short either template that I think is quite helpful. In terms of localization, if you don't have a chance to localize it in different languages, I think it's definitely still worth sending it in English to European media, especially the top media. All of the editors speak English, they know what's going on. If you can localize it, all of it, obviously that's great. Um, what we also often did, or what I do now, is something in between. We have this te text that is just meant for the editor in English, but then I have that link where it says you can find more information here. Um, that, for example, links to a translated store page or it links to a translated press page. So it's easier for them to have something translated. They don't have to do it all themselves, but also you save costs because you don't have to translate every email you send to them. Um, if it comes to influencers, it's obviously, you could use a similar template. They, again, probably still like to have a translated version of those emails. However, they don't bother too much with having translated game text. As long as they understand what the game is about and the, the GIF looks funny, they're going to be fine. So often it is easier to email them just in English. If you want to work with a PR partner, that's obviously the other option. There's a couple of options you can do. One is a pan-European agency. That means that you have one agency with one headquarter and they cover all of Europe with different people and, and just do it from the HQ of, uh, has some advantages as their communication internally is quite easy. Disadvantage is that they're not local in all the countries. Second one is agency network where you would go to a, fr a French agency that works with a German agency, works with a Spanish agency. That can work great if they work well together, but obviously there's always a bit of friction between those agencies. And then you have local agency that only serve one country. It's usually the more expensive solution per country, but it's also the solution where they have the people that are the most specialized in the market. Uh, one tip that I can give for reporting, doesn't matter if it's by an agency or by yourself, a tool I really, really like, uh, it's called SimilarWeb. It's a website, but also a Google a Chrome plugin that's for free. And it shows you the rough traffic numbers per website. So, for example, if you work with a German agency and they tell you, I got coverage for you on IGN Germany and the Rock Paper Germany, you probably think, pretty sick, that's a good deal. Where in reality, those sites are both quite small. They just uh, carry the name of the big US outlets. But if you have something like a similar web where you can look it up yourself or ask them to provide you traffic numbers, you can actually see if that website is relevant in this country. The same goes for YouTube, where you should, if you have the chance, always ask for have insights into how many views they actually generated uh, opposed to how many subscribers the YouTube channel have they got coverage on. And in the last chapter, it's just 10 tips for promoting games in Europe. Uh, no specific order, just things I picked up that I think are helpful for you. One is uh, consider culturally tally, uh, touchy subject. And that is, of course, easier said than done. Uh, often you would need a local to tell you what's going on here, but I think there's an obvious thing you can spot. And also, if you happen to do something wrong in that order, I think it always happens. It happens to big companies, you will see in a minute. But just correct them as soon as you can and be polite and open about it. So one thing in Germany that is really a big topic there is everything that's related to World War II. What you see here is Indiana Jones, how you would see it in Germany with a swastika on the guy's arm. And that's Wolfenstein too, how you would see it in Germany, as you see, with no swastika on the guy's arm. Because having a swastika in Germany uh, is illegal, or representing it. However, it is legal in the context of history, and it is also legal in the context of, not entertainment, but art. And in the other tones, it's classified as art, whereas Wolfenstein is called, uh, classified as entertainment. So there's a small line between that, but especially in video games, if you have any swastikas in it, it's illegal in Germany, your game is gonna get removed from the market, you probably have to pay a fine. So really pay attention there. There's loads of things happened there where things shipped and they had to go back from the stores and things like that. Or another one, which I'm actually not sure how it is about in Australia, but that's Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, and that's a character doing that move. And I'm not sure if that means something in Australia. Uh, in Italy, in Austria, in Germany, that is like a middle finger. That's a really rude gesture, which is obviously funny. It's a Mario Kart. So they had to patch that out because 
that character was basically showing everybody the middle finger as soon as she won. So you can see even a big company like Nintendo makes those mistakes, but obviously reacts to it really quickly and patches that out. Also a thing with culture subjects, if you base your game on nostalgia, it's often you would assume that you have a shared nostalgia with European or US markets, but sometimes you just don't. For example, if you talk about arcade cabinets, arcade machines, like here, to a German, they probably don't have a lot of memories by that, because in, like, in the 90s, arcade cabinets get banned, not really banned, but they were classified as gambling machines, like slot machines and stuff, so they were only allowed in 18 plus areas, so actually not a lot of people in Germany have any memories of arcade machines growing up. Also important to understand age rating in the different markets. Most of Europe uses PEGI, uh, it's a pan-European game information. Apart from Germany, they use the USK, which is a completely different entity. It's usually a bit stricter. They are not big fan of World War II topics. They're not big fan of blood. And one important thing to know is if you go to Gamescom, obviously that's in Germany. So you have to deal with uh, German law. And if you have a public space at Gamescom showing your game, you have to go through a USK rating, so you can't show a 16 or 18 plus game in a public space. Tip number three is address people correctly. If they have special characters in the name, you don't have to use them. However, it is nice if you do. They might look weird to you. They're probably not on your keyboard. You can Google them or copy them if they write an email and you just copy their name out of there. It's polite to have it in. Little tip for Hungary is that they usually put their second name first and then their first name which is a bit confusing and you might address them wrong. And some countries have formal greetings. If they greet you like that, just maybe greet them back like that in the email. Consider local social networks. The good thing is here, most countries have similar social networks or similar social networks are as big as in other countries. Like most countries have Twitter, have Facebook, have Instagram. Um, however, there are some local things. Like Dailymotion is a YouTube competitor. That's a thing in France. Um, Xing or Crossing is like LinkedIn, but for Germans. Uh, most Germans don't use LinkedIn, but Xing, quite interesting to know if you want to have business contacts there, it's good to have an account. And in France, we also have, for example, there's a crowdfunding platform that's quite big called Ulule. It's like Kickstarter, but for French. If you send out press communication, press releases, and so on, it's really good to keep local time zones and holidays in mind. It sounds like an easy thing to do. It's something we actually often forgot or still often have to remind myself because it just seems like a little oversight. In Europe, if you send out press releases, we usually try to do it at like at 15 uh, o'clock CST, which is 12 o'clock here, which of course is an unfortunate time for Australia. The reason why we use it is because we get cover Europe in the afternoon at that time, but also reach the US in the morning. So we actually cover both markets in it. Checking local holidays. Definitely do that. It takes you five minutes to Google. It happens so many times that we send something else and then figure out, oh, we get no coverage in France because it actually is French bank holiday or it's bank holiday in Germany. Really important. Takes you five minutes. Definitely look it up. Um, generally, if you pick dates and you want to see if there's other games coming out that time, I highly recommend steamlist.net and releases.com. Both really good websites that just shows you which games are coming out on that day. Really easy to look up. Really helpful. Tip number six. It shows you events wisely. If you go to one event in Europe, that's in Germany, that's Gamescom. Gamescom is like the E3 of Europe. It's really big, it's absolutely massive. Massive, massive consumer show, also really big B2B show. There's international press from all of Europe there, usually also quite a lot of US press. Um, so if you can pick only one event, definitely Gamescom. Gamescom takes, part in, uh, it takes place in August. That's also a bit of a dead zone. If you send anything out in August, during Gamescom or a week before, you won't get any replies. So it's also something I would mark in the calendar. It's like E3 and Gamescom time are absolute no-goes for press communications. There's obviously other events. There's Covadis, which is business-focused. Emmaus is the most indie event I've ever seen. You can't even make appointments. <laughs> Everybody just sits around. It's cool. It's really nice there. Um, in France, the biggest event is the Paris Games Week. Lots of consumers. It also comes with a B2B event called the Game Connection. Um, it's extremely big. However, it's mostly focused media-wise on French press. There's some international press, but not as much. So if you have the chance be to pick between Paris Games Week and Gamescom, definitely go for Gamescom if you want to get media coverage. There's also Indicaped Europe since last year and this year again, and something called Japan Expo, which focuses on anime and Japanese things also has games. So if your game has an anime uh, angle, interesting. 
In the UK, the biggest one is EGX in Birmingham, consumer focused. There's EGX Rest in London, which is a more indie event. Insomnia is a massive LAN party. And Developing Brighton is the biggest B2B conference. In Poland, you have the Poznan Games Arena. In Spain, the biggest one is the Barcelona Games World. And in Italy, it's the Milan Games Week. Obviously, there's loads of other local events, but those are like the biggest to stand out. If you look at it by visitors, just a quick overview. Biggest one is Gamescom, Forest by Paris Games Week. Igromir is a Russian conference. Milan Games Week, uh, Barcelona Games World, the IGX, AGX, and the Poznan Games Arena. If you go to an event because you get invited, you get a sponsorship, or you just happen to be in Europe, a few little tips how you can get media contacts or press coverage even if you don't have any contacts there. Definitely ask the events for a press or influencer list. They often have one, but don't give it out unless you ask them. Uh, check on Twitter who is going. Just type in the event name, stalk the people a bit, stalking in a nice way. Just look if they're going, write them a nice message. And also what is quite helpful, look for the, uh, look for the speaker list if there's any press or any journalists there. For example, if you're going to PAX on Friday, just in the morning, there's a panel with really good press there. So that's a really good way of finding speakers. Europe is also really good for Metacritic. Before we answer the question why, we want to look at why is Metacritic still relevant. Does anybody even care? If you don't know what it is, it's a website that collects review scores. And if you have four review scores, you get an average score called the Metascore. And the Metascore is still a big deal because it shows up in Google results. It also shows up in Steam. Um, however, not every review on the internet gets listed on Metacritic. There's only certain websites that get listed on Metacritic. All those websites are listed on metacritic.com in the FAQ, and you can look them up. So if you want to get a Metascore, or just Google those websites and write the email them. A really good trick that often helped us getting a Metascore uh, on platforms we wanted was not writing English media, because again, they're really, really busy. They get loads of emails. But writing to Spanish, Italian, and Dutch media Weirdly enough, they are also a bit overrepresented on Metacritic, so there's loads of Italians and loads of Spanish websites on it. And if you see that a website is actually on those, a review is actually on those websites, but not on Metacritic, remind the website to submit it to Metacritic. They usually don't mind, they often just forget because it's a manual process they have to do. And there's also a really good competitor that's coming up and getting bigger all the time now is called OpenCritic, which is again a review score summary website, but it's just getting bigger now. Number eight is know when to localize. If you talk to those countries, the UK, Ireland, Belgium, Netherlands, the Nordics, it's usually not necessary to localize because either language is the first language or they speak it so well that you don't necessarily have to. If you talk about Germany and Austria, it's like in between, they usually have a quite good understanding of English. However, if you can localize it, obviously it's good because also they're used to high quality German localizations. For most of other countries, if you can, it is really helpful, especially for the players, not so much for press, but for the players, it's very helpful to have localized, um, localized assets, localized games. Uh, usually the order people go for for localization is first they go for France because it's quite big market you lose out without having a French localization and then go to Germany because it's also a really big market but you can still kind of tap it with English and then afterwards Spain and Italy because they're smaller and English is also important there and what we also heard in the morning that Steam now has the drop that trending pages is uh, split up in each language, in each country. So it will become probably more important to localize your Steam page in different languages to also get trending on the different Steam pages in the different countries. Um, number nine is be prepared to locus. That is something that's incredibly helpful if you just know about it in the beginning of development and not after. If you prepare to uh, localize your game at one point, be sure it understands strange letters that are not in the English alphabet. Think about that you might have subtitles you have to implement in the game and have the mechanics there first. And really think about if you have text boxes that some languages are longer. This is one German word. <laughs> if, you, if your engine can't handle that, you're going to have problems. Not all German words are that long, but there are some that are really long. In general, uh, I found a good statistic there. You can say that German is usually 10 to 35% longer. You see the other languages there. And also interestingly, Finnish, for example, is usually quite a bit shorter than English. So that's also something to keep in mind that you maybe have to have shorter text boxes or smaller ones than you have in English. 
if you localize a game and you do it after launch, it's a really good news for your community. It's something you can push with advertisement. Really great. If you just want to tell it to press, be like, hey, French press, we now translate this game. They usually don't care enough to write about it unless it's a really big game. It's not newsworthy. However, what we usually do if you have a language after, after release, what we did here for Northgard, we see that we push a big update for the game and also attach the new languages. So most websites would pick it up and say, hey, Northgard got a really big multiplayer update. Also, you can play it in Chinese now. Also, you can play it in French now. So you really see that you bundle up so the news doesn't get lost and actually reaches your readers and your players. A tip number 10 is keep an eye on local coverage. Uh, the best way to do that is obviously sit down every morning and Google in 10 different languages. However, you probably won't do that. Another way to do, just keep an eye if a game is big in your language uh, or in a certain market is use Google Alerts. TweetDeck.com, really good website where you just log in with your Twitter account, but you can have certain columns with search terms. So if you just put in Lonely Mountains, if you just put out Dishonored 2, it would show you all the tweets that mention that game. And it's really easy to spot different articles and different YouTubers to talk about your game there. And a solution I really like is called Promoter App. Uh, it has a free trial and then costs like 10, 15 euros per month. It's quite cheap. But what it does, it has like a thousand websites it tracks every day and then it sends you a link summary every day which websites wrote about your game. Uh, how that can be helpful? I example work on a game now about a Syrian refugee called Pathout. And we were targeting all Europe and the US, but what we spotted with those tools was that we get way more coverage in Italy and Germany because those people had more association with the topic than other European countries. And the coverage there was over the roof compared to the other markets. So obviously that really helped us finding the core markets of the game. With the first press release even, we found where there's an audience that is interested in this topic. So that's the summary for today. Summary of the first part of the talk. Europe is big on the global revenue, about 20%. The main five markets in Europe are the EFIX countries, English, French, Italian, German, Spanish-speaking countries. UK media is the opinion leader. French media is really particular on language. It's good if you have translated things. Show video is massive. German media is big on podcasts and PC games. Spanish media has the big free websites. Italian media is very news-focused, very high article output. Um, if you want to approach this media, look up again how you can Google that right. And if you pitch to those media, I highly recommend using uh, short templates with their either rule. And the second part of the summary are the 10 PR tips. First of all is, if you can, talk to locals, keep an eye on consider, consider culturally touchy subjects, understand different age ratings, especially if you go to Gamescom and have to deal with the USK. Address people correctly, if you can use the letters that have languages. Check for local social networks. Look out for bank holidays, look out for um, sending out times when you do something. Pick the right events. If you can pick one event in Europe, definitely make it Gamescom. Use, your, uh, use, take advantage of Europe if you want to have a good Metacritic score, or not a good one, but even get one. Know when to translate and whatnot. Keep in mind and prepare for local because there are languages that are way longer and way shorter. And if you want to track local coverage in different countries and don't do it manually, Google Alerts, TweetTech, and Promoters are really good tools for that. So thanks again for Film Victoria for the invite. <laughs> and thanks again for listening. So the question was, if it ever safe to use Google Translate to translate communications and emails into another language, or should you just go for English? Definitely go for English. <laughs> it's like you can, you can tell, and it's often it's really hard to tell what it even says. Google Translate is great for just figuring out what people write about you and what they say about you. And also the quality of Google Translate varies a lot by country. If you ever try to read a Greek article, which has a different alphabet and it's not such a big country, it barely works, whereas in French and Germany, it works pretty well. But don't, don't do it there. <laughs> Any other questions? The question was, is a poor quality translation worth than just leaving it in English? 
Uh, and I would say it depends on what it is in the game. Mostly yes. Um, if it's just about menus and it's not totally spot on, but people get what it is and then beat them up, and they just want to start a game and pick, pick a character, that's fine. If you have anything that's a narrative game where it's about context, I think it's definitely worse to have a bad translation than no translation. It is, it is really quite hard to play something that's badly translated, and you just don't feel valued as a player. I think that's the most thing. You just think like somebody didn't make the effort to translate that, just did it half-assed, and it's just not good. Yeah, that's, the question was like, if, if Shiv Video is such a big youth forum, it's a chance that the readership is probably mostly male and young, and if how that translates to games that tackle maybe newer topics or culturally relevant topics. And I think definitely it makes it more challenging, but still, Shiv Video is, is such a big force in France that it's, 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 there's still, even if it's just a small percentage of the people that like those kind of games, you're gonna find them there. And with show video, it also has the effect that a lot of editors, probably much all editors in France, read your video. So if they cover your news somehow, you're probably going to have an easier time reaching them afterwards. So the question was like how soon after launch you should have localizations and I think the, the correct answer is obviously you want to have them from the start. Uh, often I know it's, it's difficult especially if you have an early access game or a game that's ongoing development and you can't translate it 20 times because you change things in the game. Um, that's not a good answer to that question. I think as soon as you can is good and usually it makes sense that if you translate uh, a game in the language later that you really take your time and say, okay, we have a German translation now and then actually do something with it. So at that time you want to outreach some streamers, you want to see maybe if you have an update and can reach some German press or French press or whatever language you have. I think a bad thing is just to say like, just half a year later, just put it out in the patch notes on place number 20 and nobody even notices it. I think it's good to try to make some buzz around it and also activate the local community on it. That's a good, uh, good question. I've not seen that so many times. I'm not sure how helpful it is because if you don't understand the main narrative, you don't have a benefit of understanding the menu if it's translated. So, I would still assume it's, it's still better than having nothing translated. The only thing that would be important for me as a player would be that I know that upfront. So in the Steam store, it doesn't say French, and then I download it and be like, I can't play half the thing, what's going on? But I would want to have a disclaimer and it says, look, there's some parts translated into French, but the others are not. So mobile game media in Europe is quite limited. I unfortunately don't have it in this, uh, in this presentation, but there's another one where it just shows the total amount of PC and uh, console websites and it's here and the total amount of mobile websites is just very, very small. Um, typically I would say to purely generate downloads, it's really hard to get traction in Europe with focusing on websites. Usually what we use websites for is to get Apple looking at the games. So, or Google, so the game, uh, so the, the main goal is always getting a feature, and they usually read those local websites, but just purely for activating players, it's really hard to get any good numbers out of that. Uh, 
I think I think for a couple of games, Russia is massively important. Like it's just such a big market; it's completely crazy. A disadvantage and an advantage of Russia is that it's language-wise and culturally so different that it doesn't get a lot of influence from the other countries. But for example, a game I worked with called Paladins um, is from Hyrule Studios, and it's quite, in many ways, it's quite similar to Overwatch. So it also fits character classes. It's also a shooter. Um, however, it's free to play, and Overwatch is a premium game. And Overwatch didn't target Russia as much, and Paladins wanted to have players, but also saw a big opportunity. And now there, Overwatch isn't big, but Paladins is, and they make good, good, good money there. And it's one of the core markets, but it really depends on the game. I think if you have a small indie premium game, you're going to have a hard time in Russia. But for a certain kind of games, I think it's really important. What I do definitely see is, because in terms of outreach, I usually also outreach Russian media. And for some bigger websites, it works, but the barrier of entry is usually way higher. So often you would need a local partner to really guide you through because it's such a different landscape. Okay, I think we're out of time. So thanks a lot for coming. And if you have more questions, I'm going to be around anyway. Thank you.